Thank you so much, Young Duke, for coming. My pleasure. It's such an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Is when I had conceived the podcast about impact people. Um, and impact for me was from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And impact uh, not necessarily correlates with just success. Impact correlates with really what is your influence either in your community, amongst your peers, of course, on businesses. Uh, and I was very, very keen in terms of uh, inviting my guests who have really made that impact. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, behind every podcast uh, is research. We do complete research and I, I do that research myself. Uh, and when I pretty much read about you or asked people who knew you, um, it all goes back to your early child and early influences <laughs> and how that has shaped you mm -hmm. for the man that you have become today or for the businessman that you have become today. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, going back to Darshaling, right, where everything mm -hmm. started. Yes, I think it all starts from there. And to me also, I think that plays a very, very important role. So I come from the district of Darjeeling not the main town, but within the district, the small little village called Gayabari, which I'm still very strongly connected to. I was born in my ancestral house. So out of the three of us, I was the only child who was born in the house. Yeah. And therefore my connect is very strong, but we come from a very simple and humble background. So, uh, and my father used to be a simple villager, but I think a man with a vision. And therefore he always thought that education was top priority. Mm. So I was put in a boarding school within the district of Darjeeling. There's a small little town called Kershong. I love that place. Can I, <laughs> can I come in? Yes. I love that place. That is mountainous and most gorgeous place I've ever seen. Yes, it's beautiful yeah. because it isn't as crowded as yes. the main town of Darjeeling, but yes. it falls midway. So yeah. it's got its own character. It's nice, beautiful. Very English and quaint. Absolutely, yes. yes. So we went to a school over there called Victoria, which is almost 140 years old now. So I had that opportunity of being in a boarding school, but what it did to me was that as a young boy, I was not just confined to people from mm. my part of the world, but I was also being exposed to people from a slightly different culture. So we had a lot of students from Calcutta, so quite a few students from outside of Bengal. Assam, yes, Guwahati. Right, yeah. And I think what it also did is it also made me more at par and equal, so all of us, hmm. especially in the boarding school. And then, of course, after school, plus two, I went down to Calcutta. And Hotel Which Mahi is usually a natural transition for everyone totally. who stays in the East, right? Totally. Either they come down to Guwahati or they go to Calcutta. Yeah, totally. Right. So the interesting thing is that I come from, my, as my na name suggests, Young Dup Lama. So I come from the family of monks. So until my grandfather, they were all monks. Mm -hmm. It's just that my father was not a monk. Mm -hmm. So I think that was something that is there with me, uh, something that I got exposed to very early on in my ancestral home. So ceremonies and rituals was always a part of our lives. And I think that is what uh, has kind of contributed very strongly in my career growth as well. Mm. Uh, but that's, that's a very basic background in a nutshell. So also, you know, in the midst of the tea garden. So I come from there and therefore that has been my initial, let's say, 15 years of my life. Mm. And then going down to Calcutta and doing hotel management and then a completely different... I'm, I'm going to talk about the monk <laughs> thing which you spoke about, young dude. Um, obviously, uh, as somebody who, who travels and looks at maybe uh, the monasteries or maybe, you know, the whole Tibetan culture, which is, which is in Himachal Pradesh as well, right? Uh, we have an outside view of what exactly it's to be a monk, right? But but you come from a tradition and generations of monks and then your father was a simpleton villager but deeply rooted in the monk spirituality or mm -hmm. beliefs. Let's put it this way. What exactly are those beliefs? I think it's very simple. Uh, I think spirituality is very different from the ritualistic aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But whatever we do, the most important thing is to, to have a more balanced and a more meaningful life. And I think the reason why I said it has been very impactful for me is while I've been a bartender, 
I think the bar has always been my monastery mm. and I always felt that if I do justice and if I enjoy that space and if I actually practice it well, that's my part in Nirvana, mm. you know, and uh, that's my space. So I think one of the key things that I've learned, uh, both practically as well as theoretically, from, you know, having been exposed to this whole concept of spiritual spiritualness is that, you know, it's everywhere. It does not have to be in the monastery. It's omnipresent. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's wherever you are, there's spirituality. Mm. It's within you. And I think it's also about discovering yourself. So I True. always say, you know, knowing yourself, wonderful you. I think that is what spirituality is all about. So, so true. Um, after 12th, uh, of course, you don't come from a hospitality background mm -hmm. per se and Kershaw and especially in Victoria, very diversified people mm -hmm. and from the East, right? Because there were factories there, of course, agrarian uh, economy prevailed at the time, at least when we were growing up, yes. right? Uh, and hotel management at that point in time, it wasn't one of those careers which were really looked up to, right? Yes. yes. Right. Some of it still lingers on even today, mm -hmm. but largely at that point in time. So how did this transition happen? For you? I got to know about hotel management <laughs> when, I, when I was in my ninth standard. So as a usual person from the mountains, happy-go-lucky young child, I was more into sports. Academics was not something that I was good at. Mm -hmm. So I just managed to pass exams. So mm. I was, I somehow got my average pass marks and mm. pass exams. But the ninth standard onwards, you know, you had to prepare for your ICC exams. And, you know, I saw a lot of my mm. uh, fellow students preparing for engineering, mm. for, for MBBS. And everybody had something in their mind, but I had nothing in my mind. <laughs> and then one of my batchmates actually mentioned hotel management. He was from, he was a student from Nepal. And he said, I would like to do hotel management. And it got me kind of intrigued. Yeah. And then therefore, I looked into what was this course all about. Mm. And the interesting discovery was it did not have physics. It did not have maths. <laughs> it did not have chemistry. And all that it had was food production, service, housekeeping, front office. And I said, cooking is something that I would do on mm. my own. You know, I mm. used to cook at home. So it was something that I could do. So I said, mm. okay, I just need to, you know, kind of make it more streamline. Mm. That is all that, that I required to do. I said, I think I can do this course. And then, you know, so that's, that's how it all started, the whole idea of hotel management. And how was it received by your parents or the community? Because at that point in time, as I said, hardly anyone would, would choose this. Mm. Uh, so correct. my parents had no idea about hotel let's management. Say, hotel management. Yeah. They just thought hotels were hotels. That's it. Correct. And they were all, most of them exposed to simple hotels that you would so find right, in the yeah. towns of Darjeeling yeah. and Siliguri. Yeah. So they didn't have much clue. Mm. But I think it was also the faith that they had in the child. So when I actually got through hotel management and had to go to Calcutta, mm. I think my father was very supportive, mm. despite of the fact that he had no clue what I intended to do. Mm. And I, I think he, what the good thing about him was he just knew that if he did it with his interest, I think he would excel in it. Mm. I think that belief was very, very strong. And then, mm. like I said earlier on, he was a man with a vision. Mm. So I think uh, he believed in the fact that, you know, you need to do something in life which you yourself kind of enjoy and you discover it. And, and you know, I find this fascinating, uh, Young Dup, uh, whether it's our age for our children or perhaps our parents' age for us. Uh, I, I don't go before that because my exposure was let's say just to my parents and education even at that point in time was in their minds the greatest equalizer you mm -hmm. say if you need to get out of let's just say above poverty lines mm -hmm. or if you want to be someone right they believed viscerally that education is the only path mm -hmm. for you to achieve something yes and and and, and so true absolutely yeah no, I think that that belief and that it was also the truth, not just the belief. I think that yeah. was absolutely real at that time. You know, so you had to be educated to have a better life, mm -hmm. to have a more secured life and get a secured job. So yeah. everybody just said, you've got to go to good schools. You've got to study well in order to get a good job. And it hasn't changed now. It's just that no, it hasn't. It education hasn't. pedagogy has become very wide, but Indians believe in that. Totally. Yeah. It is only now that I feel and I that's what I tell my kids. I always say that education is not just about getting a good job. Yeah. 
think now I understand the whole idea of education. Yeah. Education is being a good human being. Yeah. Fine tuning yourself to become yeah. a better human being. Right? You know, so can I tell you, because I come from <laughs> education and this is my own definition, uh, what, what it really does. And I, I truly believe that if India has to become the developed nation, right? I believe, I hate that word develop. I like that ascending nation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be education. And I'll tell you why. Uh, whether it's skills, whether it's mainstream education, um, there are billions of neurons in our in our head. Mm -hmm. um, by virtue that you learn something every day, incremental, mm -hmm. is you're rewiring your brains. Mm -hmm. You're adding to that neuron. Mm -hmm. So your ability to understand and apply incrementally every day happens through early onset of education. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to be in a social environment. Mm -hmm. Right. But as far as if that is a structured discipline for the first 15, 20, 25 years, then all those neurons which are as connecting dots start. Right. And every time you learn something new, your brain gets rewired to think something new. Mm -hmm. And it's that vicious process. Yes. Right. And I, I believe that is what education is. Absolutely. Because that is the foundation, right? You are you are you are channeling it well. Yeah, it's there within all of us. I think education, especially in the early years of our lives, is yeah. because what you need to do is you that that human nature, the human thought process, and the intelligence. You need mm. to channel it well. Yes, and that is where education plays an important yeah. role. That channelization does not really mean about a job. Yeah, it no. is about yeah. fine tuning. Absolutely, what you are good at. And I, I read this, or I think I heard this. Mm. He's saying so. What what really Another definition of education. You say, what exactly is education? You say, it's discipline. Mm -hmm. You say, what do you mean by that? And the person said, showing up every day. Showing up every day and learning something new, right? That discipline helps you in life. Absolutely. You know, it, as long as you just show up. Mm -hmm. That's discipline, right? And in that process, everything, is, everything falls in place. Everything falls in place. Yes. So, I were you always interested after hotel management in, in the bar industry or, or your influences were somewhere else and then it meandered along the way towards the bar and the beverage industry. No, so those three years of my hotel school days, I think uh, my inclination was towards food and beverage service. So okay. naturally, it was always food and beverage. I didn't enjoy front office so much because you had to be disciplined all the time. You had to keep smiling all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the food and beverage entailed both the front of the house as well as mm. back of the house. So they, therefore, I said, you know, and the, with, with the kind of person that I am, I kind of felt that I would like to enjoy the best of both worlds. Mm. So my interest was definitely f &B, but I had no idea, no clue about bartending and beverages. True. So I always say I've been an accidental bartender. Mm. So when I came to Delhi and I joined the Hyatt, interesting for me, uh, you know, while they were, I think when I when I reported to the hotel, there were 20 of us who were supposed to uh, start our job from that particular day. But interestingly, what I did with the HR is I told them that I need to join only after 15 days because I have not been home. So I mm. went to Darjeeling. Mm. So while everybody else joined on that particular day, I joined f two Fif weeks after them. And I think that was also a blessing in disguise because while all the balance, 19 of them were asked to report to banquets when i came alone after 15 days i was sent to the bar ah. so i think that was sheer luck hmm. and then i went to the bar started off by being somebody who was supporting the bar from the back hmm. of the house so hmm. doing glass wiping and picking up you know stores and stuff like that but i enjoyed that space i kind of i was working and i was enjoying my work but every time I came to the front of the house, I enjoyed that overall environment. You know, I used to see my seniors make some interesting drinks, having a nice conversation. And this was way back in 1995, you know, long staying guests in the hotels. There were a lot of regulars coming down to the bar. And what I really liked was a lot of the regular guests being almost, you know, friendly with all the staff. They were having a nice conversation. They were regulars enjoying a good drink. There was also good music. So it was mm. not just a workspace. It was a good overall environment. True at the bar and that's I think something that got me going mm. and then I, when I came to the front of the house I started holding a station so serving of drinks all of that happened but every time I looked at the bartender who was also my ultimate guru is when I realized you know I want to go behind the bar mm. and I think three months after I had 
worked at the bar one fine day when we shut the bar in the evening and we were all sitting after we closed the bar is when i approached him and i said i want to be a bartender mm. and that's when he said it requires a lot of hard work mm. if you want to go behind the bar and i said look i have no friends in delhi mm. i have absolutely no social life in delhi all that i'm going to do is sleep and come back and report to work mm. so you tell me what needs to be done mm. and i'm all yours mm. so that's where it all started mm. <laughs> uh so with ihm it was largely theoretical knowledge mm-hmm. right and this was practical application even theory was almost limited because <laughs> limited <laughs> no because while our teachers taught us alcoholic beverages i don't even know if i remember all of it I when i actually that. joined the hotel yeah. and it was a completely different uh, uh, environment yes right mm-hmm. um let's forward the story from there uh, what really happened after that you wanted to learn uh, from your guru at that point in time and did you stay in high street agency uh, for a long period of time yes so i was there for four and a half years and uh, and there was no designation of a mm. bartender i was basically an american company so the designation was a waiter and the next position that i would go through was being a captain captain and it took me two years to become a captain but while being a bartender in the year 1996 as in while being a waiter and having worked behind the bar the first big thing was the recognition that i got mm. one was the internal hotels like the hotel competition so within the hotel we had a cocktail making competition uh during during i think this is this is around december is when i w- won this the competition is within the hyatt brand or all brands no within the hotel just the hotel oh, just, just the, the hotel just Got the unit that the unit yes Got and i i won that competition i do not even know if i made a fancy drink all that i know is i made something which was blue in color and stuff like that so i think but that did give me a lot of boost mm. and then the next year there was something known as the hnfs awards at that time hotel mm. and food service awards mm. they had just introduced a category called the best bartender of mm. the year mm. sponsored by old monk mm. and i was the winner so i think from that day onwards and i had already been and that was a competition you had to you had oh, to yes. participate yes. now all the other hotels in Absolutely. india participated yeah. in that i remember we were three of us as finalists there was me from the hyatt regency in delhi there was somebody from the taj palace in delhi mm. and then taj mahal hotel in mumbai tell me something young dude if you if you just kind of pause there this aspect of you winning something right you you and me we spoke about the fact that academically you were okay like in school right i'm assuming how was how was your experience uh, in calcutta with the uh, hotel management were you in fairly okay because i think that was i wasn't as bad as i was in school in terms of my performance uh because obviously there was no physics there <laughs> yeah. right and this was more application <laughs> yes right so i think hotel management i did fairly well but not the best right not the best and then you come and you find your way and you find your passion and you put long hours behind your passion is and i'm assuming at this point in time you must have been 22 21 yes, 22 was, i was 21 and 21 yeah. right and is that the first time you were actually winning something yes i think in life i i was a sports person so okay. in school while i was not good with academics you were good with won sports. quite a few medals in my you know as as a sports person whether mm. it was badminton whether it was athletics football mm. i would play all kinds of sports but these were the kind of sports that i excelled in a lot and uh, so as a sports person yes winning was always that i experienced also also losing mm. so i had a taste of both winning because and of that yeah and yes. and that's what sports does to you yes. right yes. it humbles you yes right your yeah. highs and your lows and totally. you strive back totally and is that what you applied behind your passion when yeah, so you were a bartender it wasn't about winning a competition i think bartending was something that i approached my senior and he said you need to work hard i started coming my reporting time in the hotel was 11 in the morning mm-hmm. i would always come at 10 so from 10 to 11 i would mm-hmm. set up the bar 11 to 12 because the bar only opened at 12 mm-hmm. 11 to 12 is when i would get this empty bottles filled with water and start pouring and remembering the recipes mm-hmm. so i did it because i kind of enjoyed that space mm-hmm. it wasn't about thinking that i'm preparing for a competition okay. because i had i had no idea i just wanted to be a good bartender uh, so in at that point in time you just kind of reflect back was it something you know some people say it's my calling mm-hmm. was that your calling i think so you own that space i think so that that 50 square feet was yours your kingdom totally i think my connect with the bar was very very strong and i'll tell you the reason why uh and also i'll also tell you the reason why i left hotels mm. is because 
after having spent three years at the Polo Lounge, which, which, which still exists at the Hyatt in Delhi, I was sent to this new bar called Jins. So Jins was this new age, probably the finest and the most beautiful bar that I ever saw, especially in India. And I was sent to that bar and after having spent so almost four and a half years in the bar space, Polo Lounge and Jins, one fine day in June of 1999, I was asked to report to La Piazza, which is the Italian restaurant. And all this while, I always thought that I was a bartender. While I'd become a captain, I always thought, I didn't even feel that I was a mm. captain. I never felt I was an FNB guy. I always thought I was a bar person because I was enjoying the beverage space. I'd started to read a lot about different spirits, alcoholic beverages, cocktails. And when they did that to me is when I went back and requested that I wanted to be in the bar space. So if not gins, could you send me mm. back to the polo lounge? Mm. And the, the answer that came to me from my seniors, know, seniors that was that you need to elevate the beverage experience in La Piazza. I said, no, it sells a lot of wines and it's back of the house operations, especially mm. if you're running things from the dispense bar. Mm. So what you want me to do is, and I, I didn't want to be a hotel. Mm. I wanted to be a bartender or a beverage professional. Mm. That's when I said, okay, let me, let me just quit and see if I can find the beverage, uh, you know, career elsewhere. Mm. I still remember while I was still a bartender in Jins, I had the reason why I actually quit Hyatt was because there was one off day and I had done one wedding event for a guest of mine on my off day because he offered me to come and I had gone in one of the farmhouses and bartended there. So I knew that I could be a wedding bartender. I could still find my interest and do something about it elsewhere outside of hotels. And that's how it struck me that, okay, let me just try it. There is a world outside. Yes, yes. But, but, but tell me, obviously, you know, when you reflect back today, at that point in time, the choices were made. Um, but let's say tending uh, at a bar within a hotel space, certain kind of clientele, people who are distinctive, people who are discerning, they understand their alcohol and you are elevating or complementing that kind of experience to perhaps a world outside where it was just about mixing and, you know, I'm, I'm here to just have a good time and not have that conversation. Did that, at that point in time, did it occur to you? No, it, it did to a certain extent. And, you know, I always say that my foundation in bartending has been very global because I'm talking about 95, 96, 97. Mm. India was just opening up to the yeah. rest of the world. My hotel would maintain an average occupancy of about at least 90% plus. Mm. Mm. So we had 535 rooms and 90 plus, yeah. you know, 90% plus occupancy. There weren't too many food and beverage outlets outside of hotels. Yeah. And they were mostly global guests. And and Hyatt, especially even today, yes. is driven by FNB. Absolutely. It has some really, really strong FNB. Uh, yeah, strong FNB. What was good and what really helped me shape up my career really well, not just in terms of making a drink, but getting exposed to the world of bartending was I was catering to the, a very global audience. Mm. So there were people who were long staying guests. Got it. They would come back to the bar in the evening at six or seven, almost like four days, five days a week, because they were bored of their hotel rooms, right? True. And they would go to work straight from the hotel and come back to the hotel and then straight to the bar. That was the only place that they kind of felt that they could socialize. But, but tell me something, <laughs> if, if you debunk or perhaps add to the, when you, when you watch a lot of Hollywood movies and sometimes Bollywood movies, uh, you find that the bartender uh, carries a lot of emotional baggage of all the conversations <laughs> of guests. Is it true? Oh, yes. Yes. You know, and like I said, you know, I think while I enjoyed making a drink, it was also all of these interactions, yeah. all of these meetings that I used to have almost every day with a lot of our regular guests, irrespective of the fact that they were all hotel guests, but they were also at the end of the day, human beings and bored. And I was this young lad with almost zero friends in Delhi and they were my friends, mm. right? So I still remember on my off day, we would actually go out with my guests to another bar in another <laughs> hotel and have a drink. Okay. <laughs> so I think it was an overall thing that was happening to me in the course mm. of those few years mm. that gave me uh, or probably channelized my life mm. and my career mm. towards beverages, you know, that my interest only grew. Mm. It never... Like I never got bored of beverages. I never and got bored of Especially at bars. a time, right, where alcohol was heavily regulated. There was more paperwork 
uh, behind a bar than actually dispensing. Am I right? Because mm -hmm. if it's a foreign liquor, it has to be from a bond and the paperwork from the bond behind cages with locks. All this thing existed? Well, I'm sure it existed. The good thing about being in the hotel was I didn't have to do all of that. Ah, right? that so you had a different department. Who would and, uh, all that I was doing was just making requisition and then going down there and picking it up. Yeah. The only thing that I had to be careful was about about alcohol inventory. Mm. So I had to do it right. So my closing, because you had F&B controls and so right. unlike today, uh, F&B controls in hotels were very, very strong. So mm. you really were scared of them mm. because, you know, everybody because they had to report back to customs and all those kind of things, right? More than that, it was about the report. So if there was discrepancy yeah, and how sure. do you control liquid? Yeah, right? If there was sure. discrepancy, yeah. both ways. Mm. If you were shortage of a particular type of alcohol, you had to give reasoning why there yeah. was a 30 ml short in that bottle. Or if there was an excess, you'd have to report back and yeah. saying why there was an excess. So mm -hmm. there was enough reasoning that you had to give. And it was not if it was not convincing enough, then you'd face the consequences. So, sure. so the control was very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Right. And all that I had to do is make sure that while you were busy making drinks, so, all of so it. Mindful pouring. Absolutely. Yeah. So you got to be very, very careful and yeah. you had to maintain that control in, in in the course of this working space. But it was pure alcohol management that is happening. When, when you look at back then, 95 to let's say 2000, right, uh, at a bar, how were global citizens, including Indians, uh, consuming vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, today? Is there, a, is there a change? Yes, I think so. I think because, uh, like I said earlier on, you had bars and restaurants only inside hotels. So the people who were coming to our hotels, even if it was, it was walk-in guests, I think there were people who were from a more privileged mm. uh, segment of society, mm. right? They weren't the common man walking up to a bar. Mm. So to a large extent, these people were exposed. Mm. They were already traveling. They were already exposed to, let's say, that good life. And they knew they might not know the technical aspect of beverages, but they knew what they were drinking hmm. and they could afford to drink that. So, but it was not uh, a more, let's say, refined way of drinking. So probably they drank more expensive alcohol because they could afford to drink it, Got not it. because they enjoyed the taste of Got anything, else, Got it. Or anything else. So I think that has changed over the years. So I think at that time, people were drinking or going to fancy bars because they could afford to do that. Hmm. Hmm. Today, you go to a fancy place, not because you can afford to, Purely because you like that space or you drink. It's the, the entire experience. Absolutely. And yeah. beverage is just complementing that experience. Totally. totally. Right? Yes. We were talking about it's become a social environment right mm -hmm. now. Right? If you can just elaborate about that. Yeah. So because now with with uh, so much of change in that space, now, I mean, you see better bars and restaurants outside the hotels. Right? So the bars that I run are not bars, which is a Friday, Saturday bar. When I have to define it, I always say it's a Monday, Tuesday bar. Mm. So you can walk into the bar even on a Monday, Tuesday. It's fairly filled and you will mostly see regulars. You will see like-minded people mm. and you can strike a conversation with the bartender or with a stranger. Mm. All that you got to say is, hi, where are you from? And then you strike a conversation because you have like-minded people and it becomes more like a social environment because you're there almost three days a week. You meet friends there. The bartender knows you. The bar manager knows you. Almost everybody in the bar knows you. So... Then you go to the bar not because you want to drink alcohol. You go to the bar because you just want to meet friends. Yeah. And I'm going to come to your award-winning bar, but I just need to go back again. Um, so stepping out of Hyatt, was was that where your entrepreneurship journey started? Where, I, where did the entrepreneurship I, I didn't even know that I was becoming an entrepreneur then. Okay. It was purely about finding my footing mm. outside the hotels in the beverage space. Mm. And... And definitely weddings was where I was targeting most of the time. So the first six months after I left hotels, it wasn't easy because when I resigned, I thought I could get one party, I could get 10. Mm. And if I did 10 parties, that was uh, good enough for me to kind of survive. But getting those 10 parties wasn't e easy. So yeah. in the beginning, it was difficult. So finally, a caterer discovered me and he said, why did you come and work along with me? That's how it all started. Mm. But I did not see it as entrepreneurship. I saw it more from the lines of survival. So you're, got it. you're advancing basically yeah. your hotel career. Exactly. So yeah. then from one party to 10 parties and it kind of multiplied because also in weddings, let's say in the private party space, 
Up till then, people were only drinking whiskey and True. soda. True. I started doing cocktails. And then when I did cocktails, it was something new that was being introduced to mm. the consumers. So even the hosts were kind of saying, okay, we need to hire Lama for, for, mm. to do our weddings. And that's how it kind of grew. I think the whole idea of entrepreneurship came a little later, maybe six months after I started mm. uh, doing private parties. That is when I realized I got to build a team. And because for me to handle 500 to 1,000 guests alone was not possible. That's when I started getting a team, setting up a team. And I think unknowingly, the entrepreneurial inclination was happening then. Because when I was building a team, what I was doing was not just teaching them how to make cocktails. I was also trying to motivate them. Mm. I was also telling them a lot. And these were not you know, people who came with a very strong hotel background. They were, and we are talking yeah. about weddings. They these, were, are, these are apprentices. Yeah. And they were, they were also you know, people from a much less privileged Got it. Uh, you know, background. And therefore, I had to teach them hospitality because I had to tell them how to use the magic words when mm. they were speaking to guests behind the bar. So to a large extent, I was also doing the HR bit in finding the right talent mm. to come and work along. While with continuing them. working for, let's say, those <laughs> those caterers. Exactly. Right? And so this was like an independent unit attached absolutely. to the caterer. Absolutely. The good thing that happened is because we were building a team and because I had the very strong exposure from hotels, every time I was making drinks, even in weddings, I was always interacting with guests. Mm. So people would come have a drink and then ask for my card. And that's when I started distributing cards. And every time I knew that more cards are distributed, yeah, the more people <laughs> were marketing. Yeah. Yeah. But tell me something, uh, if I just kind of go back, back into the, the culture, right? Uh, when you were with the hotels and when you saw the guests, let's say around the bar, in the restaurant, uh, in the bar, or perhaps at the hotel, what was the percentage of men versus women? There were more men. There I think more the percentage men. of women were only maybe just 10%, mm. very less. Also, one more thing that I noticed, and I always say that this a lot, uh, there used to be couples who would come, married or unmarried, to the bar. And what I really, really didn't like and didn't appreciate or kind of something that really kind of took me uh, backwards was a lot of the women would come to the bar and then look at the menu. And instead of ordering the drinks to the bartender, they would tell the oh, men that I would like to have this. And I would always find it very weird, surprising. I would say, why didn't you just tell it to me? You know, yeah. I had to let me fix you. Yeah. But that has changed drastically mm -hmm. now. Like mm -hmm. now you'll find sometimes, you know, I see more women in the bar counter than men. Yeah. 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 Oh, so, so, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to ask that question. But you were you traveling or was it only let's say in north centric thing or did it happen in bombay as well because i kind of grew up in bombay right mm -hmm. as much as you grew up in darjeeling and kershaw and calcutta you came to delhi this time i was absolutely in bombay um i don't remember uh, and it's a very cosmopolitan right you had you had of course a smaller population parsis were very progressive then you had the catholic community very progressive uh, the the Gujarati trading community was very progressive. They may not drink, but they were very progressive, mm -hmm. right? Uh, equal participation of men and women, boys and girls in trade, businesses, everything, right? Um, I a I don't remember uh, ninety percent men and ten percent women. I don't really remember. Not that I've been to too many parties. I I also grew up underprivileged, but had I been, I think I would have seen, if not. 90-10, about 60-40 in Bombay mm -hmm. at that point. No, I think Bombay was slightly better from that point of view. Yeah. I think Bombay did have uh, a slightly different culture when it comes so, when it comes to yeah. eating and drinking out or even partying. Uh, Delhi and the northern part of India was very different, which is still different even now. Uh, but I think, you know, it was culturally very different, mm -hmm. two different cities, two different parts of this country. Uh, so I think Bombay was much more open. Mm. And Bombay was much more casual from that point of view. True, true. Delhi was still conservative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think somewhere in late 90s, 2000s, when this Gurgaon uh, started building up, right? And that's where a lot more exposure kind of came uh, came in. For Delhi had the best bars, uh, even at, that, at least within the hotels, right? Yes. Yeah. So the best bartender was in Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. So I... Yeah, definitely Delhi had better bars because 
I'm talking about the Polo Lounge in 95, 96. The cocktail culture wasn't there in India. People, you know, at the most, a guest would know a Bloody Mary or a Planter's Punch or a Pina Colada. True, true. But at the Hyatt in the Polo Lounge, we were still averaging about 60 to 80 cocktails every day. Wow. So we were selling a lot of cocktails and they were... Apart from the regular long-staying hotel guests, there were also walk-in guests who were drinking, like Kapiroshkas. Mm -hmm. mm. I still remember we would sell a lot of Kapiroshkas with this regular group of people who would visit a bar once in two weeks. Mm. And I would not like to name them, but they were very mm -hmm. influential people in Delhi. And this, there were a bunch of 15, 16 of them. And mm. they would consume like 40, 50 Kapiroshkas in one evening. Mm. So we were selling a lot of Kapiroshkas. Mm. We were selling a lot of mojitos mm -hmm. and long and nice teas. So... Mm. Uh, so yes, the cocktail was selling much, much, yeah. which goes on to say that Polo Lounge was more of a cocktail bar mm. in in the mid 90s as compared to any other bar across India. Mm. So that way I feel, and also in the wedding space, right? Mm. So Delhi had more lavish weddings, more That's space true. to do big weddings, and they were more open to uh, hiring bartenders like me to do their weddings, and mm. which also meant that they were open to serving cocktails in their weddings. Yeah. So that, that space was... Because you came with that that talent into yeah, that. Exactly. You brought that aspect yes. into the bed. Yes. Um, when was your first bar? Your own bar? <laughs> 2012, December of 2012 mm. in Gurgaon. Mm. So it was me and my business partner who was also one of my students. When I started the bar school in 2003, uh, and she was in her final year of hotel management from Delhi, uh, IHM Delhi. And that's how, you know, I met her and she came and did a few bartending with me and then never wanted to go back to hotels. So she went on to work for the liquor industry later mm. in, in the marketing space. But we were always in touch and we were always brainstormed because I had this thing that I wanted to do a bar of my own and she had a similar thought process. And we kind of clicked quite well because... Uh, because the the thought process of or the idea of what kind of a bar mm. always kind of matched mm. when we when whenever we discussed. So in early December of uh, sorry in early 2012 is when we decided that we should now do our own bar, and we also realized by then that we would never find investors because nobody uh, nobody really kind of believed in what what we wanted to create as far as the bar is concerned because. The first question that an investor asked me, I would never be able to answer that. And that first question would always be how many bars in the course of the next five years. Mm. So they were asking how And the scalable. definition of bar is also very different. Yes. They would ask me, the simple question is how many bars mm. and what numbers? And I would say, I don't know. All that I know is that I'm going to open this one bar and it's going to be like this. But they didn't understand that. They always thought that, okay, it makes no sense for me to just invest in one bar. And what's the definition of a bar in your opinion? Uh, it's a social space in a, in a nutshell, right? It's a space where people come, not just to drink alcohol. You come there because you like that space, because you want to just unwind, because you want to sit there. It's like, your, it's like a comfortable drawing room, right? Where you meet like-minded people. You are connected to that space uh, through the people who work there or through the people who visit that bar. And it's a special space. And the reason why I say that is there, there are times when uh, some lights aren't working in my bar and my guests do not even bother about the lights. It's mm. okay for them. There are also times because in both my bars, the music that we play is not a playlist that we've got from somebody else. It's purely my download in terms of whatever music I like to listen to and what mm. I feel is apt for my bar. We play that and there are times when the playlist is over and there's a, there's a, you know, absolute silence from, and there's absolute no music for almost five minutes and people don't even complain. Mm. Nobody really notices because they're so engrossed in their conversation that they forget that there's no music playing at the bar for a while. And I think now that's the connect, right? It's, and that's what you wanted to create with your first bar. Absolutely. Because that is, to me, if you ask me what exactly is a bar, I think that is a bar. Mm. Otherwise, yeah. you know, if you have loud music, that's more like a club. That's more like a nightclub. But, right? but I, love, I love the name as well. Can you just tell us? A little story about how did you come with that name for your first bar? So the first bar was called Cocktails and Dreams Speakeasy. Cocktails and Dreams because, you know, my freelance bartending company as well as my bar school was cocktail called, called Cocktails and Dreams. 
And the reason why we chose to have that name is because it resonated with the consumer then, mm -hmm. because of the movie Cocktails. cocktails. So it, when we said Cocktails, everybody said, wow, Tom Cruise, Cocktails, yeah, so yeah. they could relate to it. So they knew it was the cocktail space and it did extremely well in the, in the freelance bartending space. So we wanted to still call our first bar Cocktails mm. and Dreams, it would still resonate. But when we found this space, we realized that it was the ground and the basement. Mm. And by law, we couldn't do a kitchen in the basement. So we had to do the bar in the basement and the kitchen on the ground floor. Mm. So because you had to go to the basement for the bar, so we said, whoa, let's do a speakeasy. And that's how the, the idea of the speakeasy came. So, so what do you mean by speakeasy? For It's basically a prohibition era bar. Uh, for 13 years, America went dry in the, in the first half of the 20th century. Mm, mm, and mm. Uh, these were all illegal bars that existed mm. during those times. Mm. Right? They were, and it was called speakeasy because it was hidden. Only a few people knew about it. You had a code word to enter into these bars. And uh, the name speakeasy came from the simple fact that every time you went into this legal bar, uh, sorry, illegal bars, you had to speak easy. <laughs> you to speak easy. <laughs> now, 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 tell me something. Uh, your first bar was in Gurugram, Gurgaon at that point in time, right? Uh, here, you were part of the entire Delhi, I would say, culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why did you think about opening it in Gurgaon and let's say not in Delhi at that point in time? Was even in even in Gurgaon, it was a no man's land. So the place that we actually found to open a bar was the only place that, because we never had an investor, it was purely our savings. We didn't have enough money to pay rentals. So we uh, couldn't go to a high street location. I always was very comfortable doing a bar in Delhi because that was my base. Yeah, your home turf. Absolutely. Yeah. So we went out looking for spaces. We couldn't afford any of them. Uh, and then we came to Gurgaon because my partner used to work hmm with the liquor company and her office was in Gurgaon. So she was the one who said, let's explore Gurgaon. And mm. we came to Gurgaon. Even in Gurgaon, the high street locations we couldn't afford. So we went to this typical Huda market, found a little space, uh, and it just fit into our scheme of things because the rentals were really low. But what we understood is it is a place which could be a pure destination bar, right? So there weren't any footfalls there. It was a dead market. So the reason why we came to Gurgaon and that particular market is purely because we couldn't afford. Yeah. So the, again, with the new bar also, the first six months was a lot of struggle. But it's because it wasn't in a high footfall place. It wasn't. So and you had to promote it as a destiny. Totally. Yeah. And and we didn't change the concept at all. Hmm. We just but I think what it did is more but did than the consumers it, knew uh, know you at that point in time in Gurgaon because nobody knew. Delhi was your home turf. Nobody knew. And just, just a few friends that we had in Gurgaon, we invited them over hmm. on the day we opened the bar. So the day we opened the bar, we had about 25, 30 odd people. They were all friends. And the next day we were empty again. Mm -hmm. So that struggle was always there. The good thing is, I think it made both of us happy. We had created a bar that made us happy. Mm -hmm. you know, we always knew that we wanted to do a bar like this. And therefore, on I think that terms. kept us going. On your terms. Yes. I still remember one month after we opened the bar, there was one evening where we closed the bar with zero sales. Mm -hmm. Zero sales. And we were standing outside and my partner comes up to me and says, did we make a mistake? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I don't think we made a mistake. It's just that we've lived our dreams. Yeah. Right? And we have just enough that we can sustain the bar for the next yeah. six months. We will carry on doing this. Because there were quite a few people who also came and said, oh, you need to change your music. You mm. need to play the genre of music. You need to change your food. And therefore, yeah. you will have more young people. All sorts of critics in. giving their validation. Yes. yes. But yeah. I think very strongly we decided, we said, we will keep it the way it is. Because, because you is knew what, what you wanted. Yeah. Right? We said, this is what we wanted to create. Yeah. Now that we've created, this is our dreams. Let's live our dreams. And within six months, if it does not take off, no problem, no regrets in life. Mm. We'll get back to doing what we're doing. And we kept it alive. And I think by the time we entered into the third and the fourth month, we started to see some kind of positivity coming into the sales. Mm. And so more regulars. And every time people walked in, uh, they would always go back with a lot of appreciation. And these and were that, repeat clients coming back again. Absolutely. And they were also people who came to us uh, and kept saying that, oh, I would like to get my friend, but not all of them. Mm. They appreciation, would choose appreciation for this yeah. place. They would right. say, not everybody would like this space. I would only want to get these set of friends mm. to this bar because they would love this space. And by which uh, you thought, you know, that concept which you had on your mind, the dream which you had, you say, I worked so hard, the sacrifices 
you and your partner, your family did to ensure that this bar was there. By when was the recognition coming to you? You you, you were recognized as a bartender, mm -hmm. but with with cocktails and dreams speaking. I think I think the very first year we were awarded the you know Times Nightlife Awards. Uh, the very first year. First year. Wow. So we won I think three three awards: best cocktail bar, best uh, best cocktails, best bar, best cocktails, and best design or something. So three words, and we had no idea. We had no clue. So we just Beautiful. we just received this email saying, "Oh, you've been given this award," and we were like surprised ourselves because we never even thought that people noticed us. But I think people were noticing us. People were loving what we were doing, mm -hmm. and people were appreciating what we had brought to to the bar space. Wow! So that is when it was. How, how did you take that in? How did you take that in? Uh, because a you were not expecting it, right? We're not to expecting be named the best bar. Yeah. It gave us immense amount of, you know, happiness and also a very strong sense of accomplishment mm. that here we are uh, from both aspects, you know, from being able to achieve what we dreamt of, of not a winning awards, but creating a bar that would be appreciated by the consumer as well as the industry. At the same time, also the fact that we were also now looking at a, a dream, a, a passion that was converting into being a business mm. because the numbers were showing up. So we knew now from here onwards, uh, it is going to multiply. Right? But isn't it more added pressure only from a quality perspective that A, when you were not expecting something, of course, it was a dream project, a passion project. And now when your peers, colleagues, industry have nominated and you won this award and saying, you know what, you know it for a fact, more eyeballs will be kind of coming in. I need, if if I was chasing excellence, right, and every day is incremental excellence, I need to be speeding up, accelerating that aspect because you know what, uh, what once you come into that aspect of winning accolades, right, it's not about winning or losing. You want to have that winning mindset mm -hmm. through and through. Mm -hmm. So you put added pressure on yourself. You're saying, you know what, how can I better myself? Did you go through that journey as well? Yes. Again, coming back to what I said earlier on, being a sports person, mm -hmm. I think it, you, you, you learn how to handle mm -hmm. both the highs and the lows. Highs and the lows. Yes. Because when the recognition happened, the first thing, and even now, every time there's a recognition, I always go back and tell the team, look, while it's a fantastic thing to happen to us, it also brings in a bigger responsibility. So absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, for example, you know, the new bar sidecar has been in the world's 50 best two years in a row, Asia's 50 best four years in a row. Uh, it is fantastic. It's great global recognition. But now, and I always tell my team, I said, now the people don't come to us because it's sidecar. People come to us because it's world's 50 best bar. True. So the mindset is very different. The expectation is very different. Yeah. We got to live up to that expectation and we can only live up to that expectation if we have the understanding of what is the mindset of the guest, right? So since, since you already revealed through. the name of sidecar, my next question to you is: When did the concept of sidecar come into? Uh, <laughs> when did you conceptualize sidecar? <laughs> sidecar, the concept was anyway is always there because, like I said, Delhi was my base. Got it. So the whole idea was to open a bar in Delhi, not in Gurgaon. And but why not uh, cocktails and dreams speak easy? Why sidecar? Okay, because. Over, you know, it was six years since we had started mm. off uh, Cocktails and Dreams. It was in the fifth year that we started to conceptualize uh, Sidecar. So we knew that we would want to do a bar in Delhi. But we were also very clear that we don't want to do a Cocktails and Dreams speakeasy in Delhi. For two reasons. One is that we never wanted to go back down into the basement uh, uh, on a bar there. So we said if it's not in the basement, it cannot God. be a speakeasy. God. Secondly, uh, we were not a business which was like a QSR model. Mm. We were a business which was very concept driven mm. and also being relevant. Like Speakeasy was a bar that opened in 2012. So mm. it was probably relevant to those times. Yeah, those times. Now we were looking at doing a bar in 2018. Mm. It had to be relevant mm. to that space, mm. to that time. right? So we went to a slightly high street location in Delhi because we had a third partner. So while we also had a fairly good amount of savings that we had made. So we put in all of that. Plus we had a third partner who also came at, came on board as an investor. So we had, we could afford to go to a slightly high street location in mm -hmm. Delhi. 
but the concept has to ma- had to match that location and the time. Got it. And therefore, we said while it's going to be a cocktail bar, so the core ethos of the bar remains the same. Mm. It will not be a speakeasy. It will mm. be a slightly different bar, and that's how Sidecar was born, and that's how it all happened. And you opened in 2018, right? December of 2018. Yes. And of course, the COVID happens yeah. uh, pretty much within one and a half years. Yes. Something no one really expected, right? And the first thing which happens, of course, are restaurants which were forced to shut, bars which are forced to shut for two years. Give me a sense of your mindset during <laughs> those two years. It was scary uh, because when COVID happened, it was very there was so much of uncertainty. Mm. But there was no choice, so we had to shut the bar. And the first one week, we all went silent. Mm. Nobody spoke to anybody. So I didn't. We didn't know what was happening. Yeah, because right? we had no clue. Yeah. We didn't know what was happening, right? Mm. But then after a week is when we all got together, and uh, you know we started talking, we started connecting mm. through Zoom, and we started interacting with the team. Uh, the good thing is, uh, you know, because it was just two bars, and also we were very strongly connected to our team. The contribution came from all sides. Mm. I still remember the email that we received from the senior most manager saying, "Dear sir and ma'am, uh, while the chi- times are such, it's, it's difficult times. I'd be more than happy to contribute with everything that I can, and you can take a call in terms of how much of salary you would like to offer to me." Beautiful. And that that's gave us that's, yeah, and that's mm. something that gave us great amount of. Courage, mm. and and you know it gave us a strong boost, and we said, look, if the team thinks this way, we as the leaders of the business need to think differently. Absolutely. So said, okay, let's get all together. Let's not f- bother about what's going to happen. Let's just focus on what we could do yeah. during these times. And I think we started connecting five days a week, every day at two o'clock, and we started, of course, sharing knowledge, so beverages, but we also started doing a lot of interactive sessions, things like music, mm. for example. So there were. While we played blues and jazz, not many people in our team knew what a blues and jazz was. So we said, okay, this is the assignment. Why don't you do a presentation on the blues, where it came from, the history, and what details, and what is the kind of genre of music mm. that we play at the bar, or decor, how important is it, or having a more functional bar, what is what is a functional bar all about? It's not just about cocktail making. Mm. So we started to dig out these topics, which were otherwise not something that would happen to us on a regular basis. And uh, sharing information among the team members, and they are totally presenting to each other. And when you had these twenty-five, thirty odd minds working together, you come up with ideas and solutions. Right? Yeah. That's when we started doing. You know, we launched an online sidecar, online bartending courses. Beautiful. So, me and my head bartender, we were actually doing online courses. But then we started, you know. Connecting in a different way, so there were people who approached us. We were already doing a lot of these sessions on the ground when we were running the bars. So, for example, the EO group from let's say Lucknow, Hyderabad, even corporates, they would start getting in touch with us, and they said, "How can we?" Because even their employees were stationed in respective oh, homes, sure. and they said, "How can we bring them all together through an activity?" And we had, we curated a small little packet which said, "It it has." Ingredients, mm. a cocktail shaker. Mm. Uh, only thing that it d- did not have was alcohol. We mm. said we could send this anywhere in India. Mm. So we it's like, it's like a basket you would yes. dispatch. And then they bought into it. So we would send this and say, okay, all of your employees gets it. And on a Friday evening at six o'clock, we mm. all meet online and we'll take them through a nice experience of cocktail Lovely. session. That gave us revenue. That gave us. It didn't pay us a lot, mm. but it gave us enough to be able to. Stay afloat mm. during those hard times, right? So, but all of these ideas came from everybody was and contributing. As I, a team. I understand, but but you're young entrepreneur, right? Uh, working from cocktails, being speakeasy, getting another investor at that point in time. I'm sure a like-minded investor who believed in your dreams and passion. Then, thirty to forty staff members, their salaries. Uh, so, and and everything shut. Right from revenue, these must have been. Well, I would say incremental revenues Absolutely. would have come to you, but not necessarily the large. You had to also still continue to pay for your licenses, which were on at that point. There's no dispensation there. Uh, did you manage it, or, or did you go into debt? We did. So we had to actually pull out savings, savings, and, everything. and all that. Yeah. But what we did is again, as a team, we we came back with a plan in a very strategic manner. Hmm. 
So what we, you know, the senior guys, all of us, you know, as a team, the senior people who were getting us slightly more handsome salary. You took the cuts there. But the bottom, the stuff at the bottom. We you insulated. Know, yeah. So we, we said, okay, let's find a balance. Mm. It's about survival for everyone. True. So let's In see. The how, business survives, everyone survives. Absolutely. So right. let's see how we all can survive. Right. And I think that is something that I'm very thankful to my team because yeah. we all came together and did that wonderfully well. Right. And contributed to it. So, right. you know, we even launched a YouTube channel called Three Boss Tools, which oh. like, we could do a certain amount of episodes. And I think that was a fantastic idea. You know, we were telling stories of bars. Yeah. Uh, we also had the production team, which was also very, you know, they were regulars at the bar and they came up with this idea and we collaborated and we yeah. launched a YouTube channel. So, a lot of interesting things also happened, which may not have been possible on a regular day to day basis. And, and do you think, now, and Sidecar started winning accolades which year? 2020. First one, right? Yes. And consistently you've been yeah. winning after. So that. the first Asia's 50 was during COVID. Yeah. Oh, it was <laughs> it. So, so it was, it was for, a, for the pro previous year. Yeah. So yeah. it was for 2019, but uh, the awards was supposed to be held in Singapore in May of 2020. Mm. So we all stuck at home. We followed it online. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, even this year, you've kind of, even in the Indian space, you, you yes. got the best of all, right? Um, do you believe uh, that culture of what you invested in your people and for them to give back to you during COVID is one of the most important ingredients apart from tending, which ensures that you are where you are today? The people make everything possible. Absolutely. I think it is not... You know, one individual cannot lead such a big team, right? It is, you can do things for yourself. You cannot do things for, for everybody else around you. It is the whole team. Everybody's contribution is very, very important. Yeah. And uh, I think that is something that has worked for us. Yeah. Also, what it does is, you know, I always talk about the true work culture. Yeah. And I always say that when you work, let's say in sidecar or cocktails and dreams, we work in the cocktails and dreams culture. We work in a sidecar culture. And that culture cannot be built because I want it. It can be only be built with people who all participate as a so, team. So while the bartender does what he's good at, he also supports the floor team. Yeah. The floor team supports the bar team. Yeah. Similarly, back of the house, front of yeah. the house. And I think we've, we've been very lucky that way because we've had a team which is always enthusiastic, always very passionate about what they do. And it's fantastic to hear from guests when they come up to us and they say, oh, you know, you have a wonderful team. And that's the culture, them. that's the collaborative culture. Yes, and I think that is something that gives us a great heart. Yeah. So, so even ISH, uh, it's called the ISH way of life. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, if I have to just absolutely define it in the most easiest way, it is no one is left behind. Mm. Uh, or whether it's our peers or that is amongst the students. Um, because much like any human being, you find all sorts, right? Uh, all sorts of competency, all sorts of mindset. The fact is, if they have chosen us, the fact is, if our peers of my colleagues, my staff members, if they have chosen to give their time to us, uh, then it becomes our fundamental responsibility. Totally. I think it's respect for each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And no one gets left behind. So if, if you are not, we will pick you up mm -hmm. or somebody else will pick you up and somebody else will pick someone else. And that also allowed us during, uh, because we were one and a half years after we started this institution when COVID happened, right? And we grew. And, and I believe that that culture of our people, the students, and the goodwill of two years that we had kind of built. And of course, the 30 years behind that we had worked in the industry carried us kind of forward mm -hmm. from that perspective. And I'm sure the same thing happened with you as well. Totally. I think it is, again, like I said, it's the people. It's yeah. the people and like-minded people and people who were connected. So they all had a very, it wasn't just a workspace. I think everybody had a very strong connect to both Cocktails of Dreams as well as Sidecar. So people felt that it wasn't just a workspace. Yeah. The Sidecar was theirs. Yeah. So, right. They owned it. Yes. Right. They own that space. You, you happen to be just be the promoter of it, but exactly. the, the real owners are there. Yeah. We own stakeholders. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, um, I I don't want to ask you what is the winning formula, <laughs> right? But I do want to know that winners, if you have to decode them, like sports, is perseverance, is discipline, it's it's when body and mind is tired, you still have to show up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and be at it with that uni focus, right? Of of doing something. What do you think is that moat of sidecar or or coffee and tea? I think more than anything else, both me and my partner, we enjoy that space. You know, we are not bored of going there almost every day. And it's not a business. It's yeah, so, a passion. For example, uh, if I don't go to sidecar today or cocktails in today, it's still going to run. Mm. It's still going to have, because I know that I have a very strong team, right? But the fact that we have a connect and we just go there and we do nothing but just move around, you know, meet some reg regulars, talk to the team. So I think our connect, right? At the same time, even our team, like on our off day also, when we have trainings, there are some team members who turn up on the training. So it's their off day, they, they can skip. I think it's the strong sense of connect, which, which makes it very, very different. As you rightly said, they're stakeholders, hence the ownership is there. If Absolutely. there's ownership, they will turn up. Yeah. Then it doesn't really matter. Exactly. And even ideation, like what happened in COVID, it was not two brains working, it mm. was 20 brains working, collective effort, right? Yeah. Even now, when we have to, let's say, do a new cocktail menu or we need to do some kind of a promotion or when we need to, if there is a little bit of a complaint in last night's operations, I think we as a team, the next day always interact, debate, discuss, and then the solution does not have to come through us all the time. Mm. You, uh, offline, I'd ask you this question. You haven't read the book yet of Will Gidara. Uh, so he's was one of the founder members of uh, Eleven Madison Park, which was voted like the best restaurants. But when I'm talking to you, <laughs> right, there is so much of similarity. And he says exactly the same thing about training, about, you know, him having 50, 60, 70 member team. And it was, we were never short of ideas. Yeah. Because 70 ideas were coming onto the table exactly. any given day. Absolutely. It's now you had to pick the best. Exactly. Out of those ideas. And every idea was good. And also, you know, for example, I've been in this space for 26 years, mm -hmm. over 26 years now. So, you know, at times my thought, especially in, uh, in a space like cocktails, could be a very old school thought process, right? While I may have experience, I may not have newer or fresher ideas. Mm -hmm. But a 22-year-old, mm -hmm. and it happens to me at times, you know, like I see and look at the ingredient and I say, how did you think that would work? Because all this while I was thinking this is not true. something that would work in a drink. And they would come up with this and I was like, no, sir, why didn't you try it? And I tried it. It's like completely takes me yeah. by surprise. You know. Now, these are bold steps. These are also great things to experience when you when you work with younger minds. Which is absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, in fact, you know, if you look at my playlist of, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, right, for the last you know, three, four years so. I I can safely tell you 50% of them are perhaps uh, 30 years younger than me. And I love their ideas, the way they kind of think, the yeah. questions they ask. Um, I think they're non-apologetic about, unapologetic about mm -hmm. a lot of things. I like that aspect. You know, I learned so much totally. even from them, right? You're so right. Um, where is the beverage space today in India, right? And I'll, I'll tell you, why I'm asking you this question is a lot of students, especially would be when we broadcast this 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 particular episode, they will be keenly listening to you because you are that man of influence. Um, no longer our generation alcohol was sharabi, <laughs> right? Um, yes. Beverage is as much as a space as perhaps tech is, and perhaps everything else which is happening here in India. And I truly, truly believe that in the next 10 to 15 years where the compounding of wealth will happen. Right? And this is something which I say to everyone and to me as well. I say India may be earning in tech, in pharmaceuticals, being a doctor, being an architect, being a chartered accountant, 
uh, being a lawyer, but they all spend in hospitality. <laughs> right? They're all of them. Right? Where do you think A, the beverage space in India is? And to the younger mind, where is there a career in this space? Right? And I'm not necessarily looking at only as a restaurant here, bar, just the entire industry per se. Because you you mentor and coach and influence the industry. I think we're in the best of times when it comes to especially the beverage industry for many, many reasons. And I always say that at this point in time, it's like an open blue sky. It's like a blank canvas. You can paint it whichever way you want to paint it. It's that open and it's that vast and it's that diverse. And there is opportunities in plenty. Now, why do I say this? It's not just in botany. It's not just in the cocktail space, not just in the bar space. Look at how the consumer is looking at FMB. Yeah. 20 years ago, you could give in a, in a slightly sophisticated restaurant space or bar space, you could give the consumers what you wanted to give. Today, the consumer is so well traveled. They come and they look at the bottle and they know exactly what's there and what to expect out of the bottle. So the consumer is well ex uh, exposed. The other interesting thing that has happened to consumers, especially in India is, and, and especially in the food and beverage and more so for the beverage industry is that the amount of pride that they take in the Indian stuff. Let's say if it's a Indian whiskey or an Indian gin, until 10 years ago, Indian gin, Indian whiskey was not something that the local consumer would want to spend money on. Right? They thought that everything that was imported or Western was a better quality stuff. We couldn't make good whiskeys in India. We couldn't make good gin in India, in India or good beer in India. True. But that has changed. Today, the consumer is also taking a lot of pride in saying, oh, this is a fine Indian whiskey and I'm okay to spend three times the money. Right? And a f exactly. finest Indian gin exactly. and uh, the beers, I think. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The Indian consumer, consumer today comes up to the bar and has great amount of respect for the bartender. Mm. Right? They mm. come and if you are a professional guy, they have that sense of respect. Yeah. Right? So, which means it's matching from all aspects. Mm. Also, you will see in the course of the last five, six years, the amount of startups that has happened in, let's say, the beverage space, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Correct. Ready to drinks. True. Oh, sorry, ready to drink. You know, cocktail mixers. Artisanal. You know, ton yeah. Tonic water. Tonic water. You know, beverages. Yeah. Alcoholic beverages, craft spirits. So, the, the, the allied industries are also kind of growing exponentially. Absolutely. I just got an email from somebody day before yesterday. Young guy is an engineer. He wants to... I think he must be in his late 20s and mm -hmm. he's talking about creating uh, a robotic bartender. Mm -hmm. And he says, can I collaborate with you to understand what it takes? Now, that's mm -hmm. that's the kind of space which means mm -hmm. the way the industry is going, how do you maintain consistency? True. Right? So, you, you do not have to be just from this industry. You could bring in a lot to the table from different aspects, whether it's technology, whether it is innovative thinking, whether it is execution on the ground whether it is building concepts, even marketing. Look at the online space. Absolutely. Uh, there are people who now, like there used to be an, a standard journalist who would ask the same questions to a bartender and the next day ask the same question to a politician. Now we have a very defined writer or a journalist only writing on, let's say, beverages or food. So right. Right? So they are, they are they're also people who are passionate. They go to bars, restaurants, meet interesting chefs, bartenders, and they want to write. As, a, na as a nation, we are no longer apologetic about, about this aspect. Totally. Of the industry, totally. Right? Which was not true, let's say, even 15 years ago. Absolutely. Or 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. So that's the reason why I say it's an open blue sky. You yeah. know, look at the consumerism. And it has just begun. Yes. So, so the next 10 to 15 to oh, 20 yes. years is where you'll see that exponential growth. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. And there's growth at every level and for each and every one of us. True. Right, so you, for entrepreneurs at some stage, absolutely. for perhaps allied industries at some exactly. stage, for even service staff absolutely. Uh, in this entire ecosystem. Oh, yes. yeah. Right? Would be there. Exactly. Right. Um, the, the other side of the argument would be uh, responsible drinking. <laughs> right? Um, as a nation, at least in our cities. Right, and I ask you this question because because you meet so many people, right, from all walks of life. 
is India drinking responsibly today? I think they've become more responsible than what they were, let's say, five, ten years ago. Hmm. For sure. Hmm. Because with exposure, with learning, you know, people come and attend our cocktail workshops, so people are more open to learning what makes a whiskey a good whiskey. Hmm. Right? That wasn't the case. You know, you had the money, so you paid for it. You didn't want to know what was inside the bottle. But today the consumer hmm. the consumers are interested in knowing what makes a good spirit. You know, and what is it that I like? It's not about the price anymore. Hmm. So the awareness is tremendous. And therefore, automatically they're drinking better. Got it. And they're not drinking only to get drunk. They're in drinking it for many reasons. They're drinking it because they're socializing, they're drinking it. It is also lifestyle. It's also about moods. You know, they're, they're It's about bringing people together. Yeah. And by the way, there is a beverage. Okay. And I'll tell you a good example, weddings. I'm, and I'm directly talking where I have a consumer interface. Right? Mm. I go to people's homes and I meet them in, the respect, in their space. And I'm actually, when I do a wedding party, I'm not doing what I'm doing. I'm doing what they want me to do, right? So even when it comes to planning alcohol for an event, the involvement is such that people already have exposure. They say, mm. look, when I was traveling and I saw this beautiful bar and that's the kind of drink True. that I tasted over there, can we do something like... So there's a very clear idea of a concept. It's not about... It's not about that anymore. Yeah. It's no longer it water and tonic yeah. anymore. Yeah. It is about how do I curate to make a yeah. beautiful beverage experience for my and guests. And conversations around that. Exactly. Yeah. For my guests in my wedding party. Yeah. Now that is the kind of thought that is coming on the table. So therefore, the, as a bartender, as a service provider, you can't just be talking about Limited. So it's like an open blue sky. So mm. you go back, you research, you come out with interesting ideas, concepts, mm. and try to be as innovative as possible mm. and match what the brief is. So it's a wonderful place to be True. in at this point in time. True. You know, something changed in me uh, when I turned 50. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but uh, uh, I started looking at life very differently, right? Uh, you have been always been a spiritual person and your genesis comes from the monks, uh, the thing. But you also recently turned 50. Uh, did, you, did you go through the same emotions after turning 50 or for you it was just another year? No, I think, yes, I did realize that 50 means you've completed half a century. Yeah. So then you realize, oh, you've already spent most... 60% of your life. 60% <laughs> of your life. And then you become very conscious in the sense that now the balance, whatever number of years that you want to live. I think the a certain consciousness in mind, which is how can I be more meaningful yeah. in the way f forward? True. I think that definitely has struck me as well. Give back, pay it forward. Exactly. In your own way, exactly. whatever way. Exactly. You want to, you want to, then, you know, like it's, it's a thought, like let's say the day I have nothing much to do in life and I'm a retired person. I always want to have and look back at life and, and want to have a smile on my face mm. purely for the fact that I should have led a more meaningful life. You know, where it was a lot of taking and giving, where it was a good, nice journey. And when I have a grandchild who comes up to me and says, narrate a story, I shouldn't be thinking too much about a story, but be able to narrate a story of my life, mm. you know, which would have a very positive impact on that child, you know. And... That is what has happened to me since the last one year. <laughs> What's next for young Duplava? Uh, I just want to, you know, see probably a few more interesting bars. Uh, you know, so I still have probably, if everything is fine, I think maybe in another 10 years of my career in, in the beverage and the bartending space. So therefore, I do see some interesting bars. But more than that, I always feel that I want to inspire and I want to see the younger and the future of India and the future of this world become more, what to say, mindful, you know, and, and have a very strong sense of respect, not only for humans, but everything around us. Mm. And I think... And I want to contribute hmm. to that to, in some to form or the yeah. other. Yeah. So, you know, now that I've spent a good 26, 27 years in, in the beverage space, 
there are a lot of youngsters and I do a lot of trainings and I do incorporate a lot of this in my trainings because knowledge about alcoholic beverages, they can pick it up from everywhere. Yes. But I think what I could probably bring to the table is my experience, my learnings, and I would not like to take it with me when I go. I would like to leave that behind mm. uh, for the future to be a better future, a stronger future, and a more constructive future. You know? Kind of the way I kind of look at it, there was this young boy from Darjeeling who had a visionary parent, goes to Karshan, comes to Calcutta, comes to Delhi, works, um, wants to find his space, gets into the event space, whatever little money he had left, uh, puts the first bar out there, whatever little money further he has, he puts into sidecar. This journey, of course, has been 26 years, as you rightly said, has been, has its own highs, has its own lows. Um, to the entrepreneur, perhaps, or a student, or anybody who's watching you, and they're truly fascinated by all the Elon Musks of the world, and they're talking billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. and first, you need to make the first million, right? And that's mm -hmm. where the real pain is. What would you like? I think it's good to have an ambition. It's good to have a dream, and you should. Uh, in the present day, it's nice to be ambitious. Good to be ambitious. And my, you know, advice is live your dream, you know, go for it, give it your 100%. Uh, because what it does is, you know, how successful you would be, nobody knows. Mm. But when you dream of something mm. and you give it your 100% very honestly, sincerely, I think it makes you a much more accomplished human being. True. And it does not then boil down to how much money you made. True. It is purely about what you did and the effort that you made. So good to dream, have an ambition, but have an honest one. Yeah. That is important. Yeah. Do not take shortcuts. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I because, this, yeah, because, I because yeah. we all as human beings have to have ambition. Yes. You have to have big dreams. And always dream big. Yeah. And go for it with your hundred yeah. percent. But a honest, 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 absolutely. That is important. I, I tell this to my children mm -hmm. exactly. This. I said, take the first step. I said, forget the consequences. Just take it. Mm -hmm. You will be really surprised. Yeah. And and then you'll take the second step. And maybe you'll fall. Pick up yourself. Take the third step. Mm -hmm. And to the point, unless you don't dream, you do not know where you're going to land. Exactly. Yeah, so dream as big as you want. Um, hey, we have come to the, the end of the episode, uh, Yangdoop. But if I had to probably look into my camera and I would truly say Young Doop embodies the spirit of India. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. What you would have seen in this kind of conversation is humility, is the fact that he speaks from the heart and it's all heart that he put into his business. Uh, and that heart, that culture resonated with his people and his colleagues. And the combination of all these things is what made both his ventures super successful in India. Uh, Young Doop, your last words, that's the camera. Uh, there's a world out there listening to you. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, thank you Kunal for having me in your podcast. And it was wonderful talking about my journey as a bartender. But what I have kind of my message for all of you who are listening to this podcast or watching this podcast is very simple that I just hope that through my experiences, through my learning, there is a good amount of takeaway for each one of you, not just in the space of bartending, but also from a point of view of having been able to lead a more meaningful life, you know, a more uh, constructed life. And at the end of the day, I think whatever we do in life, whether it is professionally or personally, it has to make us happy. And if we are happy, everything around us becomes a happy surrounding and an happy environment. So I think I wish that for each one of you. And I just hope to see more uh, happy people and a happy world for all of us. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And God bless.